So welcome everyone. Today we commence the fourth week of the lecture series on African history through the lens of economics. And today and tomorrow, we will zoom on a period in relatively recent African history that has been coined as the period of the slave trades. We will start our discussion today with Nathan Nunn, a professor of economics at Harvard University, where he will present mostly his very original work on this issue. And the Q&A session and some additional remarks will be delivered by Oyabola Okunogwe. Uh, Oyabola is an economist at the World Bank Group uh, at the Development uh, uh, Research Group. And she works at the intersection of development economics, public finance, and political economy, having some very insightful and important work, for example, on the role of ethnicity, on public finance, on gender issue, with a great emphasis on her native Nigeria. Oyemola is a graduate from Dartmouth College uh, in the United States, where I spent some lovely years during my tenure clock. Uh, after that, she uh, completed her master's in public administration and international development at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. And she continued with her doctoral studies uh, at Harvard, where she completed a PhD in public policy. So Nathan, uh, thanks uh, uh, for not only being uh, a co-organizer of this lecture series, but also being with us today. And so for you, Oyebola. Let me ask you all, please start uh, posing questions. We will try to answer many through the uh, online Zoom facility, and then Oyobola will collect many of the questions and she will uh, pose it to Nathan uh, in the end of this, uh, of this lecture. Let me just make a quick note uh, uh, for our friends who are watching us from across the world, that Nathan's uh, very influential work uh, on the slave trades in historical African development started while Nathan was a PhD student at the University of Toronto. So this reflects very original and very early work. And having been uh, one, uh, one scholar working in related issues, uh, let me say that at the time, this work had a very big splash in economics research, not only because it focused on a very profoundly important issue in African history, but taking a very novel viewpoint, getting some original data on the effect of the slave trades and connecting what happened in Africa for four dark uh, centuries to contemporary development. So Nathan and especially Yebola, thanks for being with us uh, today. The floor is to you, Nathan. Thanks so much, Elias. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay, terrific. I'll assume everyone can see that. Um, Terrific. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here today and uh, to be here with Oyabola and talking about the slave trades. Uh, today, we're going to consider a question that has come up in a lot of the previous um, classes and uh, through the chat, and that is really what is the link between the slave trades and Africa's relative development uh, uh, compared to other continents around the world? Is there a relationship at all uh, between this episode of history and economic development today. Okay, so I'm going to cover uh, some of the literature uh, primarily from economics, but also history that touches on this subject. So if we think about uh, what do we mean by the slave trades, right? So you have probably heard of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, which is actually one of four slave trades that occurred simultaneously uh, on the African continent. So you can see here by this map, um, this is the transatlantic slave trade would have been uh, individuals being enslaved and shipped from the coast here the, and then the coast here and shipped to the Americas. Okay, and so that's kind of the, the, the slave trade that we're most familiar with. But there are other, as I mentioned, other three, uh, uh, three other slave trades. One is the trans-Saharan slave trade where slaves were, uh, individuals were taken from this area here and shipped to Northern Africa. And from there, some uh, to Europe and to other parts of the world, but a lot would, would have stayed in Northern Africa. There's the Red Sea slave trade where individuals were enslaved in this area here and shipped through Red Sea ports and um, typically to the Middle East and some as far as India even. And then finally, the Indian Ocean slave trade where individuals were enslaved primarily from the Eastern coast of the continent and also Madagascar and shipped to, again, the Middle East and as far as India, but also the plantation islands in the Indian Ocean, uh, Mauritius and Reunion. So this occurred over a 400 period of time. Some of the slave, slave trades, so the Saharan and the Red Sea are actually older than the transatlantic, predate it. And um, there's evidence of, of those trades going on as early as 800 
AD. Okay, and so one point is these were large trades. So um, th this is some data, which is from my research. I'll talk a little bit about. And this is a, these are very conservative estimates. So these are basically estimates of the total of number of individuals that were enslaved and then shipped in during these uh, slave trades. Okay, and um, you can see that it's kind of easily 16 million people, right? Uh, this is certainly an underestimate and uh, even an even larger underestimate, the number of individuals who were uh, raided, died on the way to the coast, died before arriving at the final destination. So this is where we, uh, the estimated number of individuals uh, that arrived at, at, their, at their destination. And then if you think of well, the number of individuals whose lives were uh, disrupted and severely affected by the trades, it would be orders of magnitude. Uh, and we can only kind of guess uh, how much, how many more individuals were affected by the trade, four times, five times, et cetera. Okay, so it's a large period of time uh, spanning from 1400 until, uh, you know, as late as 1900, if we look at the data. So what effects did this have? Okay, what was the nature of the trade? So um, we had invited Linda Haywood and Joseph Inikori, and unfortunately, both of whom had, have written extensively uh, on the subject. Unfortunately, neither was able to join us, but I wanted to go through Linda Haywood's article. I think it's just really, really fantastic and, a, and a, an excellent case study of the consequences of the slave trades. Uh, and it's her article called Slavery and Its Transformation in the Kingdom of the Congo, 1491 to 1800. And it's published in the Journal of African History in 2009, okay? So in this, she goes through and just documents mostly from a series of letters that the uh, Congo Kings wrote to the King in Portugal um, that talked about some of the issues and described the situation within the Congo Kingdom. Okay, so the first European to contact the Congo Kingdom by sail was Diego Cao in 1840, or 1483. Okay, and very soon um, the Congo King and, and the followers and uh, descendants uh, converted to Christianity. Okay, so trade initially was in what would be called legitimate commodities, uh, traded copper, textiles, ivory, as well as there were some enslaved individuals which were uh, traded. So the first individuals that were traded or sold were criminals and prisoners of war. So we wouldn't think of these as, as Congo citizens. Um, and they were traded with Portugal to pay for certain debts or as gifts. And, um, but as I mentioned, the primary trade was in uh, other commodities as well. So pretty soon though, Portugal's demand switches from uh, primarily commodities to individuals. And it starts with the establishment of sugar plantations in Sao Tome, which began around 1500. And then within a few decades, the establishment of sugar plantations in, in Brazil, right? And obviously um, this is important because there's a demand for uh, slave labor on these sugar plantations. Okay, so very soon what we see is there's an increase in kidnappings, false criminal accusations, violence, and then eventual civil war, which has its roots in the fact that individuals were enslaved and then could be sold to uh, Portuguese merchants um, and, and were exported. So this dynamic um, was so concerning that in 1514, King Afonso, who is the, the, the King of Congo at the time, writes about the Ill Ill illegal sale of individuals in the Congo. Okay, so initially individuals could be sold, but only prisoners of war or uh, criminals, right? But very soon individuals began enslaving other free men or, or women and selling them to the Portuguese, okay? And in particular, King Afonso writes about uh, the Portuguese colluding with certain Congolese noblemen to enslave different Congo uh, Congolese citizens and he talks about even children and relatives of other competing noblemen, which may have been competing for the crown or from different regions of the kingdom, okay? And by 1526, King Alfonso asks for the end of all Portuguese merchants and trade with Portugal, except missionaries. So this was kind of the tricky situation that the king was in. 
is that he had converted to Christianity, so he didn't want uh, kind of the removal of all Portuguese from the kingdom, even though you could see detrimental effects. Okay? Uh, and that's because he wanted missionaries, he wanted the Congo kingdom to develop uh, as a Christian state, much like the Christian states in, in Europe. Okay? So this process continued. Um, and you have a series of episodes of violence, uh, starting with the Jaga invasion of 1568. Um, so the victims were, uh, or the, the, the group that, up, that rose up were victims of the slave trade, which had fought back. The process continues further and further as the external demand uh, for enslaved people increases further and further. So there's many accounts of enslavement, violence, kidnapping, and, um, by the 17th century, most of those that were enslaved were Congo citizens, so individuals who, who weren't supposed to be enslaved. There's large scale civil war, and by 1665, what Linda Haywood calls uh, or describes as anarchy. Okay, and so, um, and then the last thing to note, which we'll come back to, is you know, very quickly the international commodity became, uh, or, or yeah, in, 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 international currency, I should say became individuals. So there was domestic currency, which was cowrie shells. And then the only internationally traded uh, currency was actually uh, individuals or slaves, okay, enslaved individuals. So that's the dynamic that she, uh, that Linda Haywood describes in her very, very nice paper. So I suggest anyone who, who's interested have, have a look at that. And that really, I think just with some very nice uh, data from the letters describes the dynamic which occurred which was one where the, the slave trade resulted in individuals uh, from the kingdom enslaving one another for political gain, uh, for monetary gain. And this led to a further weakening of the kingdom, which then heightened the need for even more enslavement. Okay. And at a more micro level, uh, Walter Hawthorne in his book, Planting Rice and Harvesting Slaves, talks about the effects of the slave trade. I'll just read this quote. The Atlantic slave trade was insidious because its effect, effects penetrated deep into the social fabric of the Upper Guinea coast, beyond the level of the state into the level of the village and the household. Hence, in many areas, the slave trade pitted neighbor against neighbor. So this very last uh, sentence here is what's really striking, right? That the slave trade, which was this demand for indiv enslaved individuals by Europeans, which are sitting at the coast, um, created a dynamic where in the end you had neighbor pitted against neighbor, okay? And to think about this or to look at actually hard data on this a bit more, here's some evidence from uh, and some data from Sigismund Kelle. And so Sigismund Kelle was a, a German linguist. He was interested in documenting the languages on the African continent. So what he did, this is in the 19, early 19th century, he went to Freetown, Sierra Leone, where enslaved individuals which had been freed were, were brought, and they were from all different parts of the continent. So he was interested in understanding their language, and he recorded a lot of information about their language. And But in the publication, he also asked, oh, by the way, how was it that you became enslaved? And so I went and looked at the, at the responses and just categorized them. And here you see that 24% said they were taken in war. That's not particularly surprising, but um, one thing that was strike is striking is 40% say they were kidnapped or seized, and then another 20% say they were sold or tricked by a relative or a friend. So this is someone very close to them uh, had tricked them or sold them into slavery. And then 16% through the judicial process. So this became common where the judicial process became corrupted and individuals were falsely accused of different things, witchcraft, for example, adultery, uh, so that they could be, um, become a criminal and then be sold as, as a slave. Okay. Uh, and if we look at this, which is the striking one, just at uh, how at a very uh, individual interpersonal level, uh, the slave trade had its effects. Um, so these are some direct, direct quotes. So, uh, individual was sold by his relatives, sold by his family. Uh, these are different accounts, sold by his brother because they could not agree, sold by a supposed friend, treacherous friend enticed him on board a Portuguese vessel. And these are accounts through the, the judicial system as well. Okay. So we see that, that at a very local level, at a very interpersonal level, the slave trade uh, had effects. So you might think, well, 
This is from the early 19th century. It's from primarily Western Africa. And that might be very different than other parts of, the, of Africa and also earlier in the slave trade. But actually in the Congo kingdom, uh, very early on in the 16th century, we have similar evidence. So this is Duarte Lopez who visited the, the Congo kingdom for five years uh, in his report or in his summary of, of his experiences, he writes, as a result of necessity, father sold son and brother brother, so that they, each person could obtain food uh, in any manner that they could obtain. So, so again, similar accounts of individuals because of the dynamic, the insecurity, uh, the lack of economic prosperity caused by the slave trade, uh, their only option was to turn on one another and to uh, enslave, enslave one another. Okay. And part of this was, uh, if you read the secondary literature, a defense mechanism. It really was a, uh, an environment where you had to enslave others or be enslaved, right? So if you want to protect yourself, you needed iron or guns. Uh, how would you get this? Well, you needed to uh, trade with Europeans, and um, that required having something to trade, which was an enslaved individual. Okay. So if we think of just take a step back from these accounts and also the secondary literature, uh, which I'll talk a bit more about, there are many, many mechanisms uh, and reasons that we think the slave trade may have had detrimental effects. Okay, so ethnic fractionalization, ties between village federations, which may have been forming in a process that was very similar to what was going on in Europe. Uh, Joseph Inicori has written about this extensively. Those broke down, right? And so there were ties or federations, maybe counterfactually in a few centuries, these would have turned into large, powerful states. Uh, but instead, these villages are, are raiding one another to protect themselves. Similarly, political fractionalization and weakening of states, uh, state pre-existing states that did exist, like the Congo Kingdom, experienced civil wars. There is intra-community raiding and kidnapping, uh, even at the very local, the family level, as you saw. And then a breakdown of traditional judicial systems. So pre-existing institutions became corrupted and became weakened because of, of the slave trade. Okay. So this then raises the question, right? So these are all kind of more short run effects. Uh, are there long run consequences? Do these consequences uh, persist or have they persisted until today? And are they one of the reasons that we um, have relative underdevelopment on the African continent relative to other continents? And so in grad school, this is around 2002, I was reading you know, this literature, which is fascinating and important because I'm I am interested or was, am and was interested in economic development and development, particularly on the African continent. There was really two different views you read in the literature. Uh, one is that uh, the slave trades were detrimental to African development. So you see this clearly in uh, the work of Basil Davidson, Walter Rodney, which some people through the chat have already mentioned, Joseph Inikori, and then even Patrick Manning, who will join us tomorrow. He has a great quote. Um, uh, conjecturing or uh, suggesting that the roots of modern day corruption uh, are in the, in the slave trade. Okay? And so here's a quote from Joseph Inikori that says, a consequence of the slave trade was to alter the direction of the economic process in Africa away from development and towards underdevelopment and dependence. Okay? Um, but that wasn't the only view. There was a, a number of individuals that say, no, the slave trade, it was terrible. It had disruptive effects at the, at, at the time, uh, but it's in no way responsible for underdevelopment. Okay? And so this is from David Northrup. While it is true that the slave trade was cruel and produced a climate of fear and suspicion, its social and economic effects, which can be measured, were surprisingly benign. Okay? Uh, this was a 1978 publication. Since that point, he actually has a, has a book now, which is Seven Myths of African History, and one of the myths, the cameras number three or four, is that the slave trade was economically detrimental, right? Um, and this is similar, if you read the work of John Fage, uh, you have uh, a similar, similar impression. So just two different views. And I think this is where my research comes in. It's, well, how can we get to the bottom of this? And reading this, it was kind of assertions uh, and there's kind of, you know, limited, limited evidence on this, uh, despite the fact that in this quote, um, the economic effects, which can be measured, were surprisingly benign, right? So there really wasn't, I felt, 
um, quantitative evidence, empirical evidence to test this thing. So, so what, what I sought to do was to, to really uh, take this to the data and ask are, the, ask, are the slave trades responsible for part of the underdevelopment of the African continent? Okay, so certainly we wouldn't expect one event to explain everything in the world today, but uh, is it a contributor? And so the logic of the analysis, the statistical analysis that I'll take you through is if that's the case, right? That the slave trade did have these long-term detrimental effects, which persist until today. If we look within the continent, we'd expect that those regions that were more affected by the slave trades uh, should be less developed or poorer today by whatever metric you wanna, you wanna use. If it's per cap, uh, GDP per capita, uh, infant mortality, et cetera, okay. Okay, so to undertake such an analysis, right? Basically to look within the continent and look at a relationship between the intensity of the slave trades in a location and its level of development today, you need data on the intensity of the slave trades. Okay? So for most of this or for all of this, um, the good thing for me was there's an extremely rich, was and is an extremely rich quantitative literature uh, within African history. Okay, so I was extremely amazed actually when I uh, you know, read the African history literature and I was very impressed at just how much data there was, how quantitative it was, how rigorous it was. Um, at the time, uh, Pat Manning had just written, recently written a book uh, basically undertaking demographic simulations uh, of the effects of the slave trade on populations in different regions, right? And so that's just one, I think, one great example. Now, hopefully he'll talk about that tomorrow, uh, but there's a lot of data, a lot of evidence. Um, the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database by David Deltas and co-authors was just being developed. And so from that, we know the port of embarkation of enslaved individuals, which were shipped from the continent. There were a number of other um, uh, publications put together where you had something similar for the Indian Ocean slave trade, the Trans-Saharan, or sorry, the Trans-Saharan slave trade, the Red Sea slave trade. Okay, so we had a really good sense of the number of enslaved individuals which were taken and shipped through different ports. Okay, of course, the issue is just because an individual was uh, shipped through ports on the coast of Nigeria, they wouldn't have necessarily come from or land that today is Nigeria, they wouldn't have necessarily come from that region. They could have come from further inland, uh, from Niger, Burkina Faso, for example, Central African Republic. Um, so those data had to be supplemented with actual information on the origin of enslaved individuals. Okay? And so after scouring the um, secondary literature and also some primary undertaking primary archival research, this is what I was able to find. For the Atlantic slave trade, 53 samples. You have about 81,000 individuals. So this is a tiny fraction of the total number of individuals that were enslaved and taken in the transatlantic slave trade, uh, but it is a sample. 229 ethnicities identified amongst those individuals. Uh, Indian Ocean slave trade, uh, I'll talk about this in a bit more detail. Six samples, 21,000 individuals, 80 ethnicities. The Sah Saharan and Red Sea, you can see are much, much um, coarser and rougher and more approximate, uh, but these are much, much smaller samples. Um, fortunately, uh, the Atlantic slave trade and the Indian Ocean slave trade were much, much larger quantitatively than these two slave trades. Okay, so how is it that we know the eth ethnicity? So this is a painting by uh, Jean-Baptiste de Bray. Uh, showing the ethnic markings and hair, hairstyles of enslaved individuals in Brazil. It's from the, uh, the 19th century. And if you read accounts, letters, individual ethnicity was an important characteristic uh, for slave owners. And it was something that they, they kept track of. Often it would be um, uh, through the last name. So uh, enslaved individuals, when they came to the Americas, would be given a Christian first name, John, for example example, and then their last name uh, was often their ethnicity. So John Congo would be an example. Okay, so it was something that was kept track of in the records and what type of records uh, can we use to identify the origins or the ethnicity 
of different enslaved individuals. Here's a summary of this for uh, the essentially the first three quarters of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and you can see here from, uh, this is about from 1450 to 1799, things like records of sale, uh, baptismal records, uh, uh, slave runaway notices, plantation inventories, fugitive lists, registers, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so these are all in the location in which these enslaved individuals were sent. And then there are various documents there, okay? And so that's from 1450 to 1799. And then from 1800 to 1900, you see the later period, you have uh, many more. So again, we have the number of individuals and then the number of ethnic groups, the years, and then the regions. So it's quite rich in terms of uh, information um, on the ethnic identities of these enslaved individuals. So that was for the transatlantic. It seems like in, within research, there's a clear bias uh, towards um, uh, the transatlantic slave trade. The Indian Ocean slave trade, which was also another large slave trade, uh, was one for which uh, we had more limited data. So for this, I had to go to the archives in Zanzibar and collect uh, pretty much any information I could uh, that was from a similar uh, of, of, of a similar type. And so here's one. This is uh, one document from Zanzibar. And these were lists of individuals who had gained their freedom at the time. Um, so which was actually the late uh, 19th century. And here you can see this is, and this gives you, I think, some sense of the original documents that the secondary sources uh, would have been um, based on. So you can see here, it's the name, it says the name of the slave, the name of the master, the residence, the age, the sex, and then the tribe is listed. So that's the key, key indicator for me. And then the date. Okay, so in Yasa, uh, Makwa, uh, et cetera. And then here's actually just uh, kind of interestingly, a, a deed of freedom that was provided and was provided to this individual named Sharif Nzaramo. And Zaramo was his ethnicity. So it's another example where the ethnicity is the, is the uh, last name of an individual who was enslaved, right? And so, so this, this deed of freedom was just given here as an example in, in, the, in the records, but this would be something that an individual would be able to carry around with them uh, after they receive their freedom. Okay, so that's the nature of the of the records. Just a very quick, brief description. We've seen this map before, and so this was a map uh, provided by George Peter Murdoch, where he has the approximate uh, ethnic boundaries during the pre-colonial period. Okay, so what's important here is um, there are many more ethnic groups than there are countries on the continent. So you have about 800 ethnic groups according to this classification, and 52 countries, okay? So it was possible or is possible to place each ethnic group within a country, okay? And, and the country was the level at which I did the analysis. There's some ethnic groups, so here the Congo, for example, which span multiple countries. And in these cases, I divided them evenly uh, between, between the countries based on, on land area or proportionally based on land area, okay? Um, and so once you do that, and then also the other thing I should say is in the, in, in the records, ethnicity isn't reported in a consistent way, uh, but what you really need to do is uh, link an ethnic group into, uh, to a country. Okay. And so with this, remember we have two types of data. One is shipping data. So is there aggregate uh, estimates or, or uh, numbers on the, the number of people that were shipped from different ports? right, along the coast. So if we're just thinking conceptually about the Atlantic slave trade in, uh, and so this figure shows exactly how this was done, okay? And so this is a hypothetical map of Africa. Think of this as the, or a portion of the African continent. This is the West Coast, this is North. Uh, and he, imagine you have these hypothetical countries, country A, country B, country C, D and E. So from the shipping data, so for example, the transatlantic slave trade database, we know the number of individuals that were enslaved that were taken from all the ports along the coast. So we can aggregate these up or add them up so that we know the number of individuals that were shipped from ports which were in a particular country. Okay? So of course, just because an individual 
was shipped from ports that were along the coast of this country or, or land that today is this country doesn't mean that they're from that's this country. So from country A, they may have been from country B or country D and E in the, in the case of country C. So this is where the ethnicity data come in. With the ethnicity data, you can calculate what's the ratio of individuals that we see in the ethnicity data that are from country A relative to country B, country C, D, and E relative to each other. Okay, and just as an example, assume the ratio is four to one or three to one to one, then you can disaggregate these total amounts and assign uh, estimates of the number of individuals that were taken from these ports that would have been from interior landlocked countries. Okay, and uh, because over time the slave trade <coughs> or slave capture occurred further and further and further inland, these calculations and these estimates are done century by century. Okay. And so in the end, what you have is uh, you have estimates of the number of individuals which were uh, from land or locations that uh, are within a modern country today that were enslaved during all four of the slave trades. Okay. And this gives you some estimates. Uh, in the paper itself, uh, you have the full list for all countries in the world. Right, so you can see Angola, a, a lot of individuals were enslaved primarily during the transatlantic uh, slave trade, Nigeria during the transatlantic, but also during the Trans-Saharan. So a lot of individuals who were enslaved were shipped north and also to the Red Sea. Uh, places like Ethiopia, it was primarily the Trans-Saharan and Red Sea slave trades, okay. Okay. So then the, the statistical test or the very first step is let's look at the relationship between the number of individuals who were enslaved. We want to normalize by the size of the country, right? So Guinea-Bissau is a very different size than the Democratic Republic of Congo. So we want to normalize. Uh, so it's the total number of enslaved individuals divided by the land area. And this is shown on a log log scale. Uh, so a natural log on both, si on, on both uh, axes. And what you find is a negative relationship, right? And quite a quite robust negative relationship, it turns out. And in other words, those countries or what to, areas that today are countries that had more individuals taken today are poor, okay? As measured by per capita GDP, okay? Again, you can, uh, if you have other measures of uh, uh, relative economic success you wanna use, you can use those as well. This is a pretty good summary measure. So immediately when you see that, there are some issues, right? And one might be, well, can we really take this as causal? One interpretation for sure is, well, that the slave trade resulted in economic underdevelopment, right? So uh, consistent with Walter Rodney, Basil Davidson, Joseph Nicori, et cetera, okay? Uh, but there are reasons why you might stop and say, no, no, maybe that's not the case, okay? Um, so one is, Another explanation for this, which is I think just as logically consistent is well, these areas here, right? So these countries here, what was it about them that caused them to engage in the slave trade, right? They may have had poor institutions. They may have been underdeveloped already. Um, they may have had other characteristics which caused them to engage in the slave trade. And also those characteristics persist over time. And that, causes those countries to be less developed today. So in some sense, you're just showing two measures of underdevelopment from different periods in time, but there's no causal relationship, okay? And in particular, uh, people, you know, number of individuals have hypothesized, well, maybe those areas that initially had domestic slavery or poor institutions were the ones that selected into the slave trade. Um, the other one, so that's one, one thing we have to worry about, and is that an explanation? So it's correlational, the relationship, but it's not causal. The other is measurement error, and I won't go into detail about this. Yeah, you can have a look in the paper if you're kind of interested in the econometrics, but the one thing I want to point out is often uh, outside of economics, um, in many disciplines, which are less quantitative, there's always a concern that, well, the data you're using are imperfect, okay? Even within... Um, Within economics, there's concern about that. Uh, 
So Morton Jervin has written a book and he talked a little bit about that. So it's certainly true with any data, including current economic data, GDP data, there's imperfections and a lot of measurement error. You might even think there's more measurement error than there is real variation, right? So that's true, but actually for statistics, that's fine. And there's a, a number of uh, issues or a number of ways, tools we have to deal with that. So we know what direct, how that'll bias things. Uh, if it's just noise, it'll bias the relationship towards zero, so that if you do see a relationship, it's even more striking or more surprising and more powerful. Um, the other thing is there might be systematic mismeasurement. Again, there are ways to deal with this, and the paper does this. Uh, I won't go into this, this kind of nerdy statistical details, uh, but that's just one point I want to make. It's um, in no way does statistics require any data to be perfect, right? Okay, so how do we deal with this issue that it might be selection of, individu of individuals or societies or uh, groups of societies into the slave trade? So one thing you can do is, well, you can control for anything that you can observe. Let's take into account anything on, uh, that's observable, right? If you th thought societies or those locations in Northern Africa are different or in the, in the Southern part of Africa, or more uh, mountainous societies, et cetera. You can control for that. The other one that I wanna focus on is actually number two, which is the historical evidence on selection during the slave trades, okay? And so the idea here is, well, some societies certainly had slavery before, um, before the slave trades. That caused them to select into the slave trades and a history of slavery is correlated with other things which affect economic development today. So it's really, don't blame the slave trade. It's some baseline characteristics of those uh, locations and those groups that selected into the slave trade. And also it could be not only domestic slavery, but closely related initial prosperity. Initially, the least prosperous societies were either targeted or selected into the slave trades. So I'll talk about slavery to start. Again, kind of like this, um, the issue about did the slave trade have long run effects? There is also a debate in historical literature, same, you know, a lot of the same characters, John Fage versus Walter Rodney, about whether there always was slave, slavery. Okay, And so there's one view that, oh, there always was slavery. And then the Europeans came and then they sold these individuals who were uh, already, already enslaved. Okay. And so there's definitely some mention of domestic slaves or servants uh, in the early 16th century. But um, in general, you can think of these as, as being different than uh, what we would call slaves during the, the slave trade, right? So they're considered to be part of the family. Uh, in no sense were they chattel that uh, the, the family that took them in. So for example, um, if they didn't have enough to eat or if there's other reasons that they were absorbed into the lineage of one family, in no sense uh, could those individuals be bought and sold. There was no market for enslaved individuals and the children of those individuals were not chattel, the individuals that could then be bought and sold. So, so it's very different um, from the situation after the, the uh, slave, slave trades began. And so the best evidence from this and kind of the hard evidence that I've, um, that I've seen and so what, what persuaded me on uh, one way or another, rather than just the opinions of historians, um, is linguistic evidence from Anne Hilton and Jan Bencina, right? And here the linguistic evidence is um, shown, shown in this map, which is from uh, an article by Jan Bencina called in the journal History in Africa, 1989. And we've already talked about, well, how do you undertake historical research if there are no written records? Okay. And uh, Chris Eric talked about, well, uh, linguistic evidence is, is extremely useful. Okay. And you can take an object, right? So like a slave and think about, is this object, which is a traded individual, a traded enslaved individual, uh, indigenous? So how do you know this, whether it's indigenous? Well, if it's indigenous, you should see an indigenous word that describes that object, okay? If it's a foreign technology, then most likely that foreign technology, that foreign object was introduced. And with it, because you didn't have uh, that indigenously, the term or the word for that, okay? 
And so in this article, he looks at, well, what are slaves called? And what are, slaves are called uh, Pesa, right? Which was originally a Portuguese term um, for, which meant servant or in Portuguese piece or unit, right? Um, and after 1500, it, it came to refer a traded slave and it was also um, the international currency in many places, including the Congo Kingdom. Okay, so there's this term for traded slave, uh, PESA, and which originated from the word PESA, which is a Portuguese word. And then let's look at its distribution. You can see its distribution here, right? So the first is all of these different societies didn't have their own words for traded slave, okay? Instead, they have a common word, and this common word is connected to the coast here. Uh, so this is completely consistent with uh, traded slaves, uh, um, this notion arising at the coast, right, where you have the transatlantic slave trade, and then spreading inland with waves of capture, waves of enslavement that occurred over time. Okay, so this is really the best evidence that uh, traded slaves chattel was not endogenous, right? So having individuals that could be bought and sold uh, is, or sorry, is not indigenous, um, but instead it was a concept, uh, um, something that was introduced from the outside. Okay, so that's the first thing. So it doesn't seem to be evidence that indigenous slavery predated the slave trade in those areas. So that's areas that were untouched by the Red Sea and the Trans-Saharan slave trade. So this is further south uh, from West Central Africa and South Africa, you can see. And those areas that were um, mixed up with the Red Sea and the Trans-Saharan slave trade, uh, which date back you know, much, much further back, 800 AD, we really don't have a sense, right? We'd have to go much, much further back in time. Uh, the other thing one can do is look at pre-slave trade prosperity and subsequent enslavement. So this is on the x-axis population density in 1400. So this is our best estimate, right? Um, we can also look at urbanization as well, uh, but it's our best estimate of relative prosperity. So in a Malthusian environment, any um, innovation or prosperity is most likely going to result in increased individuals. Okay? And so that's the logic be behind looking at population density. And, it, uh, and number of enslaved individuals taken, normalized by land area, you find this positive relationship. Okay, so if anything, it was the more prosperous areas which uh, supplied the more uh, supplied more slaves. Uh, and Joseph Inicori has written about this. Uh, a big part of this was strategic on the parts of the Europeans. You'd see if they could get a large uh, population group to turn on itself, like occurred in the Congo Kingdom. Uh, then this was a very effective way to obtain ens enslaved individuals, right? And so um, there's some accounts and some historians believe that Europeans very strategically provided arms to competing groups or helped uh, on one side or another of uh, rival groups to try and instigate these conflicts. Okay? And so this would be consistent with this. Uh, another example is when the Portuguese sailed down the coast of West Central Africa, initially, they were interested in, in trade uh, in legitimate com commodities, uh, identifying powerful kingdoms, setting up exchanges, et cetera. Um, and so they sailed past the, the coast of what today is Gabon, further south, because there were kind of, um, you know, no groups that they felt they could trade with until they came to the Congo Kingdom, right? So there's effectively, they were selecting or, um, are drawn to more powerful, more densely populated uh, groups. Okay, so if anything, this is kind of powerful. Uh, there's, it was the locations that were the most developed initially that were most impacted by the slave trade. And we see now there's been a reversal. These are the populations today that are the least economically developed. Okay, so then the second thing the paper does is looks at instrumental variables. So I won't go into, into this, but um, one tool to deal with measurement error or uh, selection or unobservables is if you can find an instrument. And in this case, an instrument is something that's correlated with the number of slaves or enslaved individuals that were taken, but uncorrelated with any of the characteristics 
of the country, which might affect income through other channels. Okay, and to use economics language, the um, the critical assumption for the instrument, or what you need, is an instrument that affected uh, the demand for slaves, but not the or the demand for enslaved individuals, but not the supply of enslaved individuals. Okay, and so what is used in the paper is sailing distances from a particular location uh, to the markets of demand in each of the four slave trades. Okay, so what's important here is you think, well, these exact locations aren't gonna matter except for during the, the uh, period of the slave trade, they affected or influenced the number of individuals who were enslaved from a location and then taken to these, to these markets, okay? So I won't go into too much more details uh, about this, but just ex except to say, if you use this statistical technique, then what you find is the uh, relationship is just as strong or even stronger uh, when you uh, undertake this analysis. Okay. And so all of the evidence from all of the statistical evidence I go through in the paper points to the same conclusion. And that's that the slave trades within the African continent did result in long-term underdevelopment, right? That they do explain a sizable proportion, I'll return to what sizable means in a bit, of uh, the relative underdevelopment of the African continent today. Okay, so if we think about channels, you can do a little bit where if we look at 19th century state development, state centralization, this is data from the Ethnographic Atlas and was we've seen it in a number of papers, including in particular papers by Stelios and Elias, um, you see that uh, the, no the number of individuals which are enslaved, right, is predictive of this, that these countries or these areas, these regions that had more individuals that were enslaved during the slave trade have subsequently less state development. And this is in the period after the slave trades end, but before uh, colonial rule, okay. Uh, or sorry, this is state development here, okay. Uh, this graph is wrong. This should be ethnic diversity. I'll fix that. Uh, and you see the same pattern there. Okay, so there's been a number of subsequent um, studies which have looked at other factors which were affected by uh, the slave trades. I won't go through all of these, but it, it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, each year, another study comes out showing that the slave trades are providing evidence that the slave trades uh, affected some other characteristic of certain groups within the African continent. Uh, so polygyny, for example, has been found to have been increased uh, because of the slave trades, particularly the transatlantic slave trade. So this is men having multiple wives and there's a number of reasons why this might be. Um, yeah, but the um, sex that was primarily taken during the transatlantic slave trade was men. And so you had a, a gender imbalance uh, in those locations where more enslaved individuals were taken. Uh, and so that could be part of the explanation. Female genital cutting has also been associated uh, with the trades. Gender roles, uh, HIV prevalence, uh, stronger beliefs in, in traditional uh, religious beliefs, what in the West we call witchcraft, conflict, financial development, et cetera. Okay. So let, I just wanna provide one, la one, one other example and this, uh, Leonard Wanchikon mentioned on Thursday when he was uh, gave his his discussion, and um, this was after I wrote uh, the initial paper. I was giving a talk at NYU, and Leonard came up to me and said, "You know, um, I think one of the real effects of, of of the slave trades was that it had a it was detrimental to interpersonal trust, right?" And he's actually mentioned this on Thursday that one of the motiv motivations for him thinking about this was uh, idioms. So this one idiom in fun is uh, this person will sell you and eat the money, right? And he mentioned this little kids would not say, I don't trust that guy, but they would have these idioms about, about the slave trade, right? So, so him and I teamed up and we wanted to understand, is there evidence that the slave trade had these detrimental effects on interpersonal trust, okay? So, so I often tell people, I think this is one of the importance of uh, research uh, in development and in African history being done by people who were born and raised from the continent. There's no way that someone like me uh, from Northern Canada 
would have the knowledge and the insight to even uh, test this hypothesis, right? But Leonard having been born in Southern Benin and uh, knowing uh, and having some firsthand experience about this uh, was able to um, uh, have the insight to develop this hypothesis. So after we, we got together and I would give talks uh, in different places and I would say, mention this saying uh, in fine. And uh, inevitably after many talks, people who are from different parts of the continent would say, oh, in you know, where I'm from, we have a similar saying, right? And so here's one in Wolof, same idea. Uh, here's one from uh, that's Yoruba. Uh, and these are just some examples that have accumulated over time, right? So it's not just Southern Benin, but there's many examples uh, in other areas which also experienced the slave trade, okay? So for this paper, what we did is we moved from the more macro country level to the ethnicity level. So we constructed using a very similar procedure, estimates of the number of enslaved individuals and now from different ethnic groups, right, uh, across the continent. So here's Congo, for example, uh, Bambara, um, Makwa, Yao. Uh, so um, you kind of have estimates at a much, much finer level. Okay? And so this is for the transatlantic slave trade. This is for the Indian Ocean slave trade. So you can see very different, different patterns here. Okay. Um, and then what we did then was connect this to survey data. So the Afrobarometer survey data, which uh, Leonard was working on, he was one of the, the uh, individuals which were undertaking the surveys. And from these, we know the location of the respondent and also reported in the, in the surveys and the locations are shown here, also reported in the surveys are the ethnicity. So we can actually link an individual to their ancestors by their self-reported ethnicity. And we know the land that the ancestors lived in uh, how impacted was that by the slave trade as measured by the number of enslaved individuals that were taken from that group, okay? So if you undertake the analysis, and I won't go through the details, um, but what you find is a strong negative relationship between how impacted an individual's ancestors were by the slave trade and their self-reported amount of trust in others around them. So the survey asks about trust in relatives, trust in neighbors, trust of your local council, so trust in institutions, uh, within ethnicity trust and outside of ethnicity trust. And this here is the estimated effect. So it's negative. So that means uh, uh, more intensity of the slave trade means less trust. And then the numbers are directly comparable. So that tells you the magnitude. So one thing that surprised us actually is the effects are larger for trust of those close to you. So intra-group trust is larger than intergroup trust, for example. Uh, trust of relatives, trust of neighbors, those effects are quite large, okay? So that was initially surprising, but uh, when you think back to the accounts of individuals who are friends, family, turning on one another, um, you can see that the slave trade had very detrimental effects and even larger effects for individuals close to one another. Okay, counterfactually, if you don't have a terrible event like the slave trade, then uh, family, friends are quite close, they're trusting of one another, and uh, the slave trade really, really eroded that, okay? And even more so than intergroup trust, where counterfactually, you might have some trust, but more limited of those uh, uh, which are further from you. So there's less scope for the slave trade to erode th that trust. Okay, so the very last thing before I conclude is I wanna think about the question, well, what would the African continent look like if the slave trades had not occurred? I think this is a question that a lot of people have asked in the chat from the very beginning. And so the quantitative analysis um, that I undertook actually allows you to have a precise answer or at least a precise guess, our best guess at this. So one way to think of this so what this is showing here on the y-axis is real per capita GDP. And then what we've done, each dot is a country. And it's a country, uh, all countries in the world. So we have nearly 200 of these dots. So this is, I think, Luxembourg, uh, the US, and they're ordered from um, lowest per capita GDP measured in 2000 to highest per capita GDP measured in 2000, okay? So this is the ranking or the ordering. 
So you can see there's a lot of inequality in the world. It's a lot of uh, countries that have really low GDP and then a smaller number that have high, high levels of uh, GDP per capita, okay? And then the other thing you can see is the red dots. What are those? Those are dots, uh, those are countries which are on the African continent. So in other words, those are what we call African countries, okay? So if you look at this, they're not evenly distributed, okay? There's this clear, if you think of the poorest, I can't remember what that is, poorest 25 countries in the world, 23 of them are uh, on the African continent, okay? So uh, when, you, when people say, oh, you know, the African continent is the poorest continent in the world or particularly poor, this is the data that they're referring to. This is what they're referring to. So what we can do from the estimates, from all of that statistical analysis, we have estimates of what was the effect of enslavement on income per capita today. And for each country, we know how much enslavement there was. So we can undertake a counterfactual or calculate, well, what would their income have been if instead of you know, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of enslaved individuals taken from that country, zero were taken, right? In other words, what, hap uh, what would have happened if there was no slave trade in that country. Okay, so once you do that, this is what you get. Okay, so you can see that global income has gone up, right? Uh, because now we have the slave trade, okay? And then, but the other thing to look at is, well, let's look at the distribution of these uh, red dots, okay? So it's no longer the case that they're bunched way to the left. If we think of, well, maybe all of these countries from here over. So the 150 less developed countries in the world, we would call those developing countries, right? Uh, so it'd be not OECD, not Europe, not European offshoots. You see that the countries from Africa are pretty well represented. They're pretty evenly distributed throughout th that group. So what does this mean? I think one way to say this in words is if the slave trades had not occurred, countries within Africa would look very similar to other less developed countries, right? Look similar to South Asian countries, Southeast Asian countries, Latin American countries. It wouldn't be this exceptional place, um, this continent uh, where you have uh, less development than other parts of the world, right? European countries in their offshoots would still be exceptional, but Africa would not be exceptional in terms of thinking about uh, the rest of the world. Okay. okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say. I'm happy to take questions. I'm very excited to hear uh, Oyabola's comments. And at the end of the slides, which will be posted, are references to uh, the articles that I've, that I've mentioned here. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Oyabola for now. Thanks very much, Nathan. And greetings to everyone. It's great to see such a large number of people online to be part of this lecture series. I am very honored to be here and I thank Nathan and the team for inviting me. And as I was listening to his presentation, it felt like I was back where I was about a decade ago uh, during my first two years of the PhD, just um, learning about all of this. So the QJE paper came out, I think, um, in 2008 and then the AR one in 2011. So this was all like in the early years, very formative period for me as a graduate student. And I just remember some of this, so this slide with the quotes um, talking about what slavery means in Yoruba and thinking about the terms that we use to describe, like if somebody doesn't speak the language, ah, they can just sell you if you follow them, you know? And, and this made it very real to me. And so I just wanted to reflect a bit on how this shaped a bit of my own intellectual journey and how I um, and how I've just taken many of those lessons with me since then. So I remember listening to all of this and this got me thinking about my own research. And during my master's program, very people don't believe me when I say this, but I was a macro uh, person. I was thinking about like currency unions and West African currency zones. And um, this really this idea of looking at very micro evidence to think about growth um, shifted me in a different direction. So I remember then I started thinking of what other historical events have happened that I'm aware of. I was thinking of my 
home country, Nigeria, and the civil war was a big thing. So for those of us who grew up in Nigeria, I think, at least where I grew up in Oyo States, we were not taught about this in school. It was mentioned in very passing terms in social studies, like, oh, this thing happened. I know it was a long time ago. Let's not worry about that. All we care about is the future. But this made me start wondering whether we did see long-term effects of an event like this. And so I remember going to the Harvard Library to check out every book there was on the Civil War. And of course, you know, recently I'd read Chimamanda's Half of a Yellow Sun. And also I think around that time was when um, Chino Achebe had the book There Was a Country. But this being able to read all these personal accounts from the library, some by leaders, some by historians, just really made me appreciate how big of a problem um, that was and how there were so many ways to think of how it was even persistent to current day. So I thought I was gonna write on that and I was um, really digging into that, trying to think of what would be like a good empirical strategy that would create um, the type of evidence that in economics we would um, believe as being rid of all the um, kind of effects that Nathan was describing earlier about the um, things that might impede our causal interpretations. So that paper is still not written because I couldn't find anything. I'm guessing there might be people on the call today who would have uh, would be much more successful in that. But what it did lead me to was to learn about the steps that Nigeria took at the end of the civil war. So um, the leader then go on, one of the things that he started was the National Youth Service Corps. And I was reading about that. I mean, everybody knew about NYSC, but I didn't realize just how tied this was to the civil war. And so just reading about that and thinking, and the old um, vision that the leaders had of how by sending people to different parts of the country, you would increase, um, you rebuild trust, you rebuild um, intergroup relationships, and that how this would then hopefully have a positive effect on the overall trajectory of the nation's growth and development. So I decided instead to research that and to write about that. And I was looking at how, just from talking to NYS officials, how it was that people were assigned to different parts of the country um, and how this created a way of trying to identify the impact of the place that they are sent to on people's attitudes. So I was able to partner with the university to find cohorts of a cohort of their graduates about seven years after they had finished. Um, the NYSC and did a survey with them on just looking at their attitudes towards them, their own group, towards other groups, towards the country, basically trying to look at these measures of uh, national integration. And I do find that being exposed to other parts of the country, this actually does improve people's sense of um, national pride. And then surprisingly, I find that it also then improves their um, sense of their own ethnic pride. So, on the one hand, they are more exposed to what the overall country uh, is like. They have the sense I'm part of this bigger entity than my own nationality, than my own ethnicity. But then at the same time, because I've been exposed to these other groups and I'm living almost as an immigrant in these other groups for this period of my service, it highlights how the distinctions between my group and other groups. And so I also see then that people are, um, have the sense of higher national pride as well as ethnic pride. And I also noticed that once the NYC has moved you once, you're significantly more likely, four times more likely to on your own then go and live amongst another group um, in another part of the country. And so I just wanted to share this story and hopefully inspire people online. I imagine we have many graduate students on here or people in the earlier, early parts of their research careers to think about how these different um, sessions and how this might link back to contexts and institutions that you're very familiar with and things that you would be well positioned to um, explore. So I'm now going to dive into the many amazing questions we've had. Um, and the first one I would start with is this point that you ended on Nathan about thinking about what would have happened if the slave trades had not occurred. And your point was that countries in Africa would have looked similar to other developing countries. Um, one of the questions we have here is that what would have happened actually to the um, Western powers, so to speak? Like um, you, almost, it's 
in terms of what would have happened to them if the slave trade had not occurred? How would their development have been different? I'll give that one first. Yeah, so I, I think that's a great that's a great question. Uh, so an important question. So there is there is some evidence actually, um, actually a fair amount of evidence. So there's a paper by Asimoglu, Johnson, Robinson, the American Economic Review in 2001, a paper by Luigi Pascali in the American Economic Review um, more recently. I can't remember the year, maybe about 2016. Um, and both of those actually look at Europe. So you're thinking of Europe and you're thinking, how did the Atlantic trade, so which is one arm of the three corner trade where individuals were taken from Africa, sent to the Americas, worked on plantations in the Americas, then raw commodities in the Americas. So like sugar, tobacco, cotton were then shipped to Europe, which were then manufactured and then manufacturers were shipped to, to Africa. So that's the three corner trade. So how did that trade, and I've talked about uh, the African continent, how did that trade affect Europe? And what they find is it it benefited Europe, right? So it was a big part of the industrial revolution. There does seem to be evidence of that. Um, so in that figure that I showed you, uh, if you remember uh, past the richest 50 countries, these are European countries and then their offshoots. So you can see that they were much, much, much more wealthier in terms of per capita income in 2000 than the rest of the world and are today. So you, you might think those countries might not be quite as rich as they were, right? And so uh, that's one reason why I kind of focused on uh, the, the other 150, because it is true. So one might want to think about, well, you know, in your minds, do you wish the slave trade had not occurred? That is one thing you want to keep in mind is while well, Europeans might not have benefited uh, as much, the Industrial Revolution might not have taken off quite as quickly, uh, and even certain countries uh, in Western Europe might not be as wealthy as they are. Right. So that's a that's a fact because I think some of this was zero sum. Right. The exploitation of labor, the extraction of surplus, uh, it did benefit uh, others. Right. And 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 Western Europe ultimately they got cheap. Uh, cheap commodities, which um, uh, fueled then production and helped uh, helped spur uh, the industrial revolution. Um, so, so yeah, I think I think that's definitely true. And the paper by Luigi Pascali also has this nice analysis of all countries in the world. This is a bit later; this is 19th century trade, and you can see in the, in his evidence that most countries were hurt by being integrated into global trade, and a small number of countries, very small, which is basically Western European countries benefited, right? So again, that kind of highlights the zero sum nature. There's global trade, one group benefits, the other group, the other group hurts, yeah, or, or is hurt. So yeah, so I think that's that's a fact. Uh, and I think there is a zero sumness about this that, um, but the other way of looking at it is global inequality would not be uh, as, as high as it is today, right? And so, yeah. Thanks. Um, now I'm thinking about, this is a question from Dennis and Dembo. He actually had two questions. Um, I'll focus on one that says, did the abolishment of the slave trade, did it lead to decline in the economy of the enslaved region? So what you showed today was thinking long-term. But the idea is that if in the short term, the, ens the regions that were supplying the slaves, if this contributed somehow to the local economy then, and then when it was abolished, did that lead to in the short run and immediately. Yeah, so I think that I, you know, that hasn't been studied quantitatively anyways. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot, lot written uh, in, in the history literature. Um, it's a bit hard to, to say. I think anytime you have change, there's, there's disruption. And so you had an old system of production, an old system of economic activity, which was based on enslaved individuals and then domestic slavery. And then with the abolishment of the trade, um, that uh, that some of those opportunities or some of those trade uh, abilities to trade uh, previously were no longer available. And so there would have been less capital coming in, um, but there may have been benefits uh, in terms of uh, if that reduced the demand for, for capture of individuals, then that may have had benefits, but there probably was some, some disruption in the short run. Um, and then the tricky thing is, though, too, is you had the rise of uh, 
plantations and then colonialism uh, soon after. So it's hard to, to really think about, well, what the counterfactual would have been, right? And so, uh, so you had a, a movement to in di uh, domestic slavery and then to forced labor during the colonial period. And so, yeah, but I think, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a very, a, a, a very, very interesting question. And so, yeah. Okay. And the one question that was asked in different ways by different people, um, so Hermione Hall is and it, as asking, what was it about Africa? You know, so why was Africa the main source of slaves? Was it the collaboration of local chiefs? Was it something about personality? Um, Lucy Mathusis asking, were there slave trades in other continents? Or was it only Africa? Why did the slave traders choose Africa? So I'm just wondering if you could say about something about this. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that's an interesting question, uh, and in particular, um, because it, I, as we've heard, uh, Africa as a whole is land abundant and labor scarce. So it's you might think, well, why is it that you would uh, take individuals from a place where individuals are so scarce and they should be they should be more valuable? Um, and I think one is uh, moral justification that individuals that look different from Europeans, you could justify that um, uh, you could justify your actions basically. The other is because the continent didn't have Christianity. And so I'm sure there's moral justification and you see examples of this is, well, we're bringing them to the Americas but they'll become a Christian. So they're actually gonna be better off, right? And so, so again, there's this justification and then and then the notion that they aren't, you know, uh, what you see in the U.S. South, for example, they aren't quite human or they're not, yeah, equivalent to, to European descended individuals. Um, so those are two examples or, or two explanations. Another is, um, and it's related to the other question about do you see enslavement in other parts of the world, which you definitely do. Um, in the Americas, there is there were attempts for indigenous to enslave indigenous populations. You could imagine just from a purely economic point of view for plantation owners uh, and and those engaged in the slave trade. Well, indigenous populations, you don't have to make the long voyage across the transatlantic, and so if you could enslave them, then um, uh, then that would be more efficient. And this was attempted. Uh, indigenous population, I think, were less robust in terms of being. Uh, uh, they were more, they were less robust, more susceptible to disease and to death. The other thing is they would have known the territory, and so they were probably more likely to escape and successfully escape. And and also to know this, so to put, put up more of a fight. So so for individuals from the African continent, you can imagine just how demoralizing and mentally uh, exhausting it was to undertake the voyage in these cramped slave ships. And you realize there's just no hope that you'll ever get come back home. So you may, you know, individuals from the African continent relative to individuals who are from uh, the Americas uh, may have behaved differently uh, as well. So, so in the end, you see that uh, history tells that, yeah, there's much more enslavement of uh, populations from Africa. And, you know, uh, likely that's, that's another reason. Um, and then there was slavery in many other parts of the world. What makes the, the slave trades within Africa unique is, um, one is just the extent to which people are, 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 are chattel. So, and there is such a large market, uh, and slave people are chattel, and there's such a large market for it. Um, and that you had slavery ex extending uh, beyond the community, into the community, I should say. Uh, so in Rome or Greece, um, you tended to have an order where you would enslave, but you wouldn't enslave citizens, right? And you can see, as the example of the Congo Kingdom shows, that kind of broke down very, very quickly. And so I think that's the other thing. If, if we think about it comparatively, then um, that makes the, the slave trades in Africa unique. And there is a paper by Elliot Green, who's at LSE. And what he did is, is he said, he took my paper and said, Okay, we have this for the African continent. We see it correlates with income per capita, but we also have some examples, not to the same scale, of slavery and some trade in slaves around the world. So, what if we extended that data set, which has 52 countries, to include all countries in the world? Will we see the same pattern globally? So, this you know, a number of 
uh, locations in Southeast Asia, for example, that had slavery. And so he did this and finds uh, the same pattern globally as you do uh, within Africa, right? And so, yeah. That's great, thanks for sharing. Um, so one question by Abu Lux Lucky Oshioke is asking why did the slave trade last too long? And um, I wonder if this is connected, but Frankie Shuko is also asking about the numbers, dropping numbers from 1700 to 1799 on the first table you showed about the number of slaves in each century. And so just thinking about why exactly this went on for so long, your thoughts? Yeah, um, you know, I'd have to go back in terms of the second one and, and um, look at the table to understand his exact, <laughs> but I think the 1600s, this is the, uh, uh, Trying to think, seventeen. So what? What period was the drop in numbers that he's referring? He says seventeen hundred to seventeen ninety nine. So the yeah. And seventeen. Okay, I I have to go back and and see if if there is a drop relative to yeah. There could okay. be a drop from the seventeenth century for sure, and then um, yeah. But I don't think the drop is too too large in terms of the okay. total. Oh. Yeah, anyways, yeah, I, I don't think I showed estimates by century, actually. Uh, I think that's estimate number of slaves. Oh, at the, the very, very beginning. At the very beginning. At the very beginning, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I'd have to go back and look at that and then see and see which slave trade it was driven by. And so but I think in the Atlantic, there's, there is, that is part of the height or just the aftermath of the height. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, so the first question is- About why you went on for too long. Yeah, so, so you know, why was it such a huge trade? And the reason is um, that you had all of this land in the Americas, which the indigenous populations were uh, decimated. So according to Denevin and there's others that have estimated, um, you know, 90% of the population at least was killed by disease and violence in the Americas, right? So then, so then you had all of this fertile land you had the discovery of uh, new world crops. So tobacco being an example, um, certain varieties of cotton. And then also you had uh, land that was suitable for globally traded commodities like sugar, right? So you had all of this fertile land, you had new crops mixing together from the Columbian exchange. And then you had an, a rising demand for this in, in, uh, in Europe. And, um, and so there are huge profits to be made. Right, and there was huge, huge demand for labor and huge returns to labor being used in the Americas. So, if we think of it in economic terms, the marginal productivity of labor was probably, you know, just astronomically high. Right, and so, and then how was this uh, demand for labor fulfilled? It was through the slave trade, through enslavement. Right, and uh, and I think why did it persist? Because it continued to be profitable. Right, and it wasn't until the abolition, obviously, uh, that it that it stopped. But uh, but I think it's you know purely economic is the reason that it persisted for so long, as long as it was profitable to to do so. And then the moral the moral values of those engaged in the trade allowed them to continue the practice. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thanks. I'm going to ask now. I imagine you knew this was coming, but this is from Oluchego Olumoyewa. He's asking that uh, about reparations. So, for the activities of slave trade, shouldn't the beneficiary nations of the labor of slaves be paying reparations or compensation, or do something worthwhile to compensate for the loss of lives and economies of Africa? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's um, a good question. So. And it's one that I think a lot of my research is looking at history and then its connections to today. So, and there's, you know, um, a lot of my research or uh, uh, one of the main messages of my research or what I've found is there are connections. So there's always connections to the past until, until today. So then the question is, um, what do we do about that? Which is a tougher question. <laughs> and then, so uh, because any, any event of the past is gonna have effects well into the, well into the future, right? And so, um, and I think for sure our goal should be um, improving global equality, right? Uh, and whether the question is, I think the question is whether reparations are the best method to do this or uh, making adjustments to change the structure of uh, 
the global system of the uh, global economic system, global power system um, is, is it maybe even more fundamental and more needed than, than reparations. Um, and then with reparations, I guess it's an issue of who pays and who's responsible. Uh, obviously everybody who, who was responsible is no longer alive and uh, who, who should be responsible and should individuals be responsible for their descendants or, uh, or you know, for their ancestors um, is, 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 is another question, right? But, uh, but I think it could be not necessarily uh, the descendants, but uh, kind of um, the world as a whole uh, could make efforts to uh, improve uh, the current situation and kind of uh, increase equality around the world, right? And so, um, yeah. Oh, and can I can, can I just share one one thing? Sure. Because yes. uh, there was the question about the the uh, drop, which confused me. Oh, yes. but so because uh, we can see it here. Um, so so 1700, 1799, um, I guess as I kind of remember this, you know, this is kind of a high period in terms of intensity. So uh, so that's what confused me a bit <laughs> about it's the, actually the highest <laughs> it's actually the highest yeah and then it kind of peters off and then late late, late 17th century is also going to be reasonably high but uh but here you kind of have the yeah uh at, at least according to these to these estimates and so it's kind of the heyday yeah of this okay, so, yeah. okay great um now i still along the lines of thinking about what can be done um there's a question here by Akinpelu Olujaba, quite early on in your talk, actually, with asking about the overall relevance of all of this history and statistical data on the history of the slave trade to future economic developments of the African continent. So if somebody comes to you today and says, okay, fine, you have all this nice data telling us what happened now, what we care about is how the African continent develops. What, do you, what would you say is the relevance of all of this? Yeah, so there's, I guess, a few things to think about is one is um, it's, to put it quickly, or to like, you know, is it's helpful to know where you came from, to know where you're going next, or where to go next. And, uh, you know, this is, people have said this in many ways, um, you can learn from history. Um, and so, but what does that mean more practically? Well, in terms of policies, right, how do we move forward? So, so just take the example of distrust, right? So it's definitely not something I think that policymakers would have been thinking about. They might've been thinking about more proximate things like why isn't entrepreneurship higher? Why isn't you know, self-employment higher? Why isn't, uh, you know, why in, is it with businesses, it's harder to get loans, all these sorts of things. Um, but with this, it provides some evidence or, or at least that you should be focusing on this or you could be focusing or at least think about this particular characteristic or this particular issue, uh, which is a bit a bit deeper. And similarly, um, one can look at data on the relationship between local level corruption and then the intensity of the slave trade, and you do find do find effects there, right? And so, um, so so I think that's helpful in terms of knowing, given that this was such a huge event and shaped the continent. And Warren Watley talked about he's writing a book and just which is basically explaining how the, the, the contact with the Europeans and including the slave trade shaped the African continent in many dimensions. And he talked about matrilineal kinship and saw polygyny, et cetera. Um, I think the other thing too, is there's another view, which is, well, Africa as a, as a whole is less developed because it has bad geography, right? Because of malaria, because of uh, the tsetse fly, and it's not through history, but it's because those cause problems today. So we need to really focus our efforts on those things, which I think are important. If you want people to be healthier, addressing malaria and addressing other diseases, tropical diseases is super, super important, right? Um, but if whether or not this will lead to, to long-term economic development is a bit less clear if the relative development that you see today was primarily shaped by history. Right, and so, so I think that's another lesson as well that um, um, that it's not as simple as oh, the, you know, the geography isn't it is isn't is too tropical in Africa or something like 
purpose, right? And so, so I think that's another lesson. And then, um, and then I think just understanding the the cultural variation, the institutional variation, the kind of fabric of the continent is helpful no matter what for understanding what effects policies will have. So I gave the example of in a previous discussion about um, how bride price shapes the efficacy or affects the efficacy of education policies, right? And so that's one, ex one example of that. And if the slave trade is connect connected to uh, matrilineal kinship, which is kind of the opposite of patrilineal and patrilineal shape to the, is connected to bride price or shaped bride price, then, uh, then you see there's a connection between the slave trade and then the efficacy of policies today. Thanks a lot, Nathan. I think those are all the questions that we'll be able to take. Um, <clears throat> there are, I think we've got a total of about 300 questions. There are over 250 that are still left that, you know, I'm sure that I couldn't really um, fully digest in the time we had. But I think that um, this has been a really good conversation. And I would note that there were maybe 20, 30 questions on that last slide of the, what would the European countries look like today? Um, just uh, that <laughs> triggered a lot of people saying, definitely they think things will be quite different. Um, I want to let everybody know that even if you didn't have the chance to have your question addressed directly by Nathan, just given the number, the volume of questions that we had, there's going to be a group from Wheeler that's creating this full list of all the questions we had, and they would prepare <clears throat> responses to some of the most common questions, and that will be posted on the website very soon. And I, before I hand this over to Elias, I just also wanted to, um, I forgot to mention in my earlier comments that Nathan was one of my PhD advisors. And so um, I'm really, <clears throat> excited for everyone here to be able to benefit from just the same experience that I had. And so I will give it over now to Alice. Thank you, Yabola, and thank you, Nathan, and thank you all for posing these questions and being so engaging. We received more than 300 questions, as Yabola mentioned. And Leonard and I were responding to about the 50 or so. Uh, and let me say that we're all, it's time consuming, but it's very exciting for us to deal with these questions. And as Oyebola pointed out in the Q&A for this week that we hope to release by Monday, uh, we will take many of those questions and we will try to, to elaborate and then provide additional references, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let me make two remarks here that on Fridays, we will have recitations, three. Uh, we started last week, we had about 500 friends joining us. So uh, actually that's something that, uh, that many of you are interested in. The amazing teaching fellows that we have actually will delve on many of the questions that you have been having about the slave trades. Second, tomorrow uh, we will have a, a special uh, lecture zooming again on this period that has been coined as the slave trade period, uh, hosting Patrick Manning, a professor of history who has done very important work on population dynamics in Africa about, he has tried to map African diaspora outside the continent, and who has been, as Nathan pointed out, one of the four, the forefront researchers uh, in this uh, broad area, uh, alongside uh, Ugo Nkogiezi, uh, uh, who has studied in Africa, is now a professor at the University of California at Berkeley. He has done a, a lot of work on the impact of the slave trades in Nigeria and Western Africa more generally. And he has also done some work on African diaspora outside, issues that relate to many of the questions uh, that we have been receiving uh, uh, today. So I hope to see you all tomorrow in the special session where we will continue this fascinating discussion we started today with Ayubola and Nathan, zooming more into history, if you like, and actually connecting to population dynamics, which are spot on questions that we receive. And hopefully the teaching fellows, and also quite often we also join in the special recitations, we will have more to say about that. Our final request is that we have kept the questionnaire open because we received many emails over the weekend to keep it open for one more week. So we kindly ask those who have not completed to take the time and to fill it in. It is a unique opportunity for the voices of all of us to be heard. As communicated, Leonard, Stelios, Nathan and I plan to release some of the statistics in future lectures and also write something with the beliefs of the people who are interested in this topic 
from Africa and outside and what we believe in. Hopefully this will be crucial shaping research in the years to come. Thank you all very much. Hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you again, Oyebola, for being with us today. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you all. It is actually, let me say, stunning that, you know, such high participation and very lively engagement throughout the one and a half hour. Thank you very much. Thank you.